Hello, my name is Darcy and this is Fostering Cats. Today I'm going to talk about tips to help ease a congested neonatal kitten. Upper respiratory infections, often referred to as URIs or kitty colds, are a common problem in fostering cats and kittens, but most problematic for nursing kittens for a couple of reasons. First, nursing kittens need to breathe through their nose in order to suckle. Congestion makes nursing difficult or even impossible. Second, your eye symptoms can be difficult to spot unless you are vigilant and know what you're looking for. But before I get too far into this video, let me remind you, I'm not a veterinarian and this is not veterinary advice. Treatments using antibiotics and antivirals uh, can only be done after consulting with a veterinarian. This video isn't about treating your eyes, but managing the symptoms. Whenever possible, I will list references for the information and when things come from my own years of experience, I will state that. But remember, to always do your own research. Do not blindly believe anything just because it's posted on social media or even because the person seems credible. Recognizing the early URI symptoms for in bottle feeders requires a lot of vigilance and knowing what to look for. One of the first signs or symptoms is failure to gain weight or losing weight. Make sure you're weighing the kittens at least once a day, if not more often. You may also notice a reduction in eating because as I stated, if they can't breathe through their nose, they can't nurse. Austin Pets Alive recommends weighing both before and after you bottle feed a kitten and says that a kitten should gain about 5% of his body weight at each feeding. So if the kitten weighs 100 grams before feeding, it should weigh 105 grams after eating and I've linked to their information. You may also notice clear nasal discharge or audible breathing sounds. And the audible breathing sounds can be very subtle. The last kitten I got that had a URI, it was just like a tapping sound that you had to listen closely for. I decided after recording this video to include a video of the kitten that was congested. Here is the video without any enhancement of the audio. Now here's the same video, but I've enhanced the audio to make the breathing sound slightly more audible. Now, Maddie's Fund does have a really great URI scoring chart, which talks about all the different symptoms you can see with the URI, and I've also included that link. Now, I'm not going into all of the symptoms of a URI, but here are some major warning signs that indicate you do need to consult with a veterinarian. Rapid breathing. A kitten's respiratory rate will be between 16 to 32 beats per minute. So anything above that indicates that they're struggling to breathe. You may also notice abdominal breathing or open mouth breathing. And then finally, you know, refusing or unable to nurse. Now that I've talked about the symptoms of URI, let's talk about ways you can help. So the first step would be increase the humidity in the room. Healthy nursing kittens should be kept at 55 to 65% humidity. Anything below that and you're running the risk of dehydration because kittens' skin dries out anytime the humidity is below 50% in a room. If you have a small, weak, or ill kitten, it should be kept in a room with higher humidity, up to 85 to 90%. Purchase a hygrometer to keep track of the humidity levels in the room. There's two major ways to increase humidity in a room, vaporizer or humidifiers. According to Mayo Clinic, there's no difference between a humidifier and a vaporizer. Um, because by the time the water vapor reaches the airways, the mist will be the same temperature. But the benefit to using a vaporizer is that you can add medicines for inhalation to ease nasal and chest congestion, which leads me to my next tip, which is adding Vicks VapoSteam to a vaporizer. Now, before you start commenting, yes, I'm aware Vicks VapoSteam contains eucalyptus oil. It also contains synthetic camphor, menthol, which is peppermint oil, cedar leaf oil, and nutmeg oil. Yes, these substances can be toxic when ingested or used without dilution 
in certain diffusers. The amount contained in Vicks VapoSteam is not enough to harm kittens when used correctly for short periods of time. Always put Vicks VapoSteam into the vaporizer water, not the medicinal cup on the top, and use only the amount specified on the box. Never apply Vicks directly to a kitten and keep it out of reach of your cats. Getting the kitten to breathe is more important than the small risk of possible side effects. No studies exist suggesting Vicks VapoSteam is safe or harmful. I know vets who have recommended it and I've discussed it with several vets who have all agreed with the decision to use it. So understand that I have looked at the risks, I've weighed those risks and decided that the benefits that I have seen outweigh those risks. Another way to add humidity is a nebulizer. Now nebulizers are different than vaporizers and humidifiers. I'm not gonna get into all of the differences, but it basically helps get the saline solution or nebulizing solution directly into the lungs to basically help that congestion. I prefer putting kittens in a carrier with a towel over the top and then attaching the nebulizer to the front of the carrier then using plastic containers like I've seen other people use. And the reason I used to use a plastic container to nebulize, but I've had older kittens get very stressed out in them and they don't get stressed out in a carrier because it's something familiar. And I see the same effects in a carrier as I do a plastic container. It's beneficial to put a drop of saline solution into each nostril of your cat or kitten before nebulizing. This helps clear the passageways and ensures the nebulizer mist gets into the lungs. Turn on the nebulizer for about 20 minutes. Let the cat sit in the carrier. Turn on the nebulizer for about 20 minutes. Then let the cat sit in the carrier for an additional 20 minutes with a towel over the carrier. So your cat will be in there for about 40 minutes. I will nebulize at least twice a day, sometimes as often as four to six times a day using only saline solution. Now I've included here a list of nebulizing solution. I will admit, I've only used the first two. I use pretty much saline solution, 9% saline solution, usually from a sub-Q fluid bag. I've also used a couple of drops of Vicks VapoSteam plus the saline up to twice daily. The last four solutions are things that I have come across in my research and through the years. I've never had a veterinarian say that we should use them, but I'm including them just for your reference. So all of these have prescription medicines that you need to acquire from a veterinarian. The third one is actually from a webinar I attended. I had taken a screenshot of the solution and didn't write down the we the webinar name or anything because I hadn't planned to really share it with anybody. And so I'm confident of the information. I just can't give the exact reference. Nose drops. As I said, it's good to do a drop of saline in each nostril before nebulizing, but you can use nose drops on your own if you're not nebulizing. And there's three different, basically, solutions of, that you can use for nose drops. First is just plain old saline. Saline drops flush out the nasal passages, thins out the mucus, and stimulates sneezing. Sneezing gets mucus out of the lungs and nasal passages. Sneezing is good. Serenia may also help reduce inflammation, but there's no scientific studies to support it. I've used it. I haven't seen huge benefits but I know people who have. Um, and you basically dilute one milliliter serenia to nine milliliters saline, it's a 10% dilution, and do one to two intranasal drops daily or every other day. Now the third one is Little Noses Nasal Decongestant Nose Drops. These are sold for kids, babies, infants, and you basically can use one to two drops twice daily for up to three days. There's a lot of anecdotal reports and I am somebody who has used it. I do feel like it can be beneficial. I did find one source um, of a veterinarian who recommended it for congested cats, but he wasn't talking about using it on neonates. So just keep that in mind. I've done it, but I don't have any good sources that says it's beneficial. Now, how to give nose drops. Don't try to use a little bottle. It doesn't work. There are two ways to give nose drops. There is what I, the method I like, which is the syringe method, where you basically just take a one milliliter syringe, you put it saline solution, you kind of get it to bubble at the tip, and then gently touch that to the kitten's nostril. Dakin's Humane Society has a great video on this method titled Kittens Giving Nasal Drops, and I've included that link in the description or at the end. The other method is the Q-tip method, which uses a cotton swab to get the drops in the nose. 
a YouTuber called Kitten School showed this method at the three minute mark of their video titled Simple at Home TLC for a Cat with a Cold. And I've also have that link in the description or at the end of this video. The next suggestion is increasing fluids. Now a lot of these solutions are things that are recommended for constipated kittens, but they work for kittens with colds too because you want them to have more fluids because the more dehydrated they get, the thicker the mucus in their nose gets and the more congested they become. You can use Pedialyte in place of water in your formula up to 50%. You can also add additional water or Pedialyte to the formula. One source recommends doing it 50-50 with Pedialyte for 24 hours. So one part mixed formula. So that means you've already added your water to the formula and then one part Pedialyte. You don't want to do that for longer than a day. You can also mix it 25% more water or Pedialyte to the formula for two to three days. So if you had a cup of mixed formula, you would add a quarter cup of Pedialyte or water. Give electrolytes. Oral electrolytes such as Breeder's Edge Puppy and Kitten Light have salt plus glucose or dextrose for energy. Pedialyte with glucose um, can also be used, but must be diluted 50-50 with water before giving it, if you're giving it straight. And finally, uh, I did find a source that talks about doing colonic fluids. I've never done it, but I feel like this would be something if I didn't have the option to, to, to. And finally, as I was doing research for this video, I came across a source that talked about using colonic fluids as a sort of alternative. The colon absorbs water and fluids. I'm including it here just to put it in, you know, your realm of things to consider. Not, I've not done it. Giving subcutaneous fluids is something I believe is absolutely essential for anybody who is taking kittens that are you know under three weeks of age. It will make a difference. Congested kittens are likely nursing less, which means they become dehydrated. Kittens that age won't exhibit external signs of dehydration until they are severely dehydrated. Extra fluids though, even before they're dehydrated, helps thin that mucus in the nasal passages. Remember to warm fluids before giving. If you're giving room temperature fluids to kittens, you're chilling them. Use caution when giving fluids to anemic kittens. The only real danger you can do is if you have an anemic kitten, you can give them too much fluids and that thins out the blood, according to veterinarians that I've talked to. And if you don't know if you're dealing with anemic kittens, then you shouldn't be giving sub-Q fluids. You can use either saline, which is 0.9%, or lactated ringer solution. But one of the sources that I have says saline does not need to be processed by the liver and is better for acute issues in puppies or kittens. La the lactate in lactated ringer solution is preferred for long-standing issues of fluid loss, but it has to be processed by the liver. And then neonates liver is not fully functional until after six weeks of age. So they basically were saying use saline, but if you don't have saline, use lactated ringer solution. Now, unless advised by a veterinarian, you should only give about one milliliter per pound per hour, which is 20 to 30 milliliters per pound per day. So that would be like for a 120 gram or quarter pound kitten, six milliliters daily. Now let's talk about feeding when they won't nurse. So if you have a kitten who is not nursing or nursing less, of course that is a severe issue that you need to be consulting with a veterinarian. But for short term, you can use dextrose or white corn syrup rubbed on the gums. This will help prevent them from um, developing hypoglycemia. You can also syringe feed a small amount of dextrose. Uh, I've given here a source that talks about how much dextrose you can give orally to a kitten, which is five to 10% dextrose orally at one milliliter per 100 grams. That's just because I don't really have a dosage that I give. I, you know, I kind of eyeball it, which is not good unless you know what you're dealing with. So uh, this is my source. Don't inject because dextrose must be injected intravenously. You can also use NutriCal instead of dextrose or white corn syrup, but I find it too thick and sticky for bottle feeders, and it just ends up getting all around their mouth. So for young bottle feeders, I like dextrose because it's not as sticky. It's going to be absorbed more easily in their mouth. In general, tube feeding is considered safer than syringe feeding, but both can lead to a kitten aspirating and developing aspiration pneumonia. Nursing is always best. Okay, let's talk about a two feed kitten. Not to go into too much detail, but you need a 3.5 to 5 French feeding tube. 
That's what uh, the FR means. It's French unit. Remember the seven P's of tube feeding. And it's actually, I developed this. Somebody had posted a five P's. I extended it to seven P's for all of the kind of tips. Pre-measure and mark the tube. It's the, you know, want to measure the tube from the last rib to the tip of the nose because you need to know where that mark is so that you, the tube stays down. Pre-warm both the kitten and the formula. Prevent the kitten from pulling out the tube by swaddling it. You are amazed how one day old kittens can get their paws just right up to pull that tube out. Prod the kitten so it vocalizes before feeding. If they are vocalizing, you're not going down the trachea. Push the tube with the chin down. Uh, pass the tube diagonally across the mouth and down one side of the throat. Left side is best. This is a tip that a veterinarian who taught me how to tube feed showed me is that you start like on the right hand corner of the mouth and then you aim the tube for the left side of the throat. So that way you're sure to be going down a side, not down the middle. Because down the middle is the, you know, I guess the trachea that goes to the lungs. You need to go to either side of that, which will go into the stomach. And then finally, this actually tube came from one of the videos that I'm linking. The pinch or kink the tube before pulling it out to ensure that there's no milk that gets away from the tube and into the lungs. And that actually came from a youngest old cat lady in her video on how to tube feed a kitten. I've included two tutorials on how to tube feed that will show you as video. I think they're both great. Do watch it. Tube feeding is something that's like, until you learn how to do it, it's really stressful to do it. And I still stress every time I do it, and I've done it a lot. I'm always worried I'm going to screw it up. But at the point that you're doing it, you're out of options. So learn to tube feed. Get somebody to show you or watch the videos, study them. Okay, suction. You can suction out the excess mucus from the nose. You can use either a baby nasal aspirator or a what's called a Dealey suction catheter. And I have links to those in uh, my description. Nasal aspirators work, but you have to make sure it presses up against the nostril. And it can be a little bit kind of stressful as you're trying to get it to fit. But it works. In a pinch, it works. The smallest Dealey suction catheter that I've seen sold is by Revival, and it's 6.5 French units. Chest percussion therapy, aka coupage. Now, this is typically only done if a kitten is suffering from pneumonia. Normally, it's done with a cupped hand, but since kittens are too small, you'll need to do it with a few fingers. You pat firmly but gently on one side of the chest. Um, and in a description that I've linked to, they talk about the impact should make a sound Similar to drum beats, the impact should be firm enough to loosen fluids that may be trapped deep within the lungs, but not so hard as to cause pain or discomfort for your cat. Now, Hannah Shaw, better known as the Kitten Lady, briefly talks about percussion therapy in her video, Helping Kittens Survive Pneumonia, at around, around the seven minute mark. But keep in mind, when I watch her video, because I've done percussion therapy, the way she shows it seems a little bit light, and I think it's just the way the video is showing it. So you have to kind of use a firmer impact. I'm not trying to criticize her video. I'm just saying I, when I looked at it, knowing what I'm looking at, I felt like it looked lighter than what you would need to use. You're not, I mean, you're not pounding the kitten, but you do need to use a pretty firm pat. Now I'm going to give you three final suggestions. These are kind of mild suggestions. Elevation. Elevate the head. Give them a warm rice sock, which seems to be very comforting. Or the U-shaped neck pillows, which work great because they're kind of, you can put them in the center and they kind of have, like, they're not going to flop over. Probiotics. Add probiotics um, to their milk, which can help boost a kitten's immune system. I love Fortiflora. I use it a lot. And finally, oxygen. Consider purchasing an oxygen concentrator. An inexpensive, non-medical grade oxygen concentrator costs about $300 to $700. Medical grade versions are more expensive and require a prescription. Okay, and I said this isn't about treatment, but more about assisting, but I will give you a couple of things about antibiotics and antivirals. So antibiotics are used to treat secondary bacterial infections that can develop with URIs, not the URIs themselves. I see a lot of misunderstanding about this. I, with people saying, my kitten is sneezing, it needs antibiotics. No. Your kitten needs antibiotics when they develop a secondary bacterial infection, usually indicated by colored nasal discharge. If you give antibiotics before they are needed, 
you're going to end up with an antibiotic resistant infection. It doesn't help prevent the bacterial infections. So don't do it too soon. Talk to your veterinarian before giving an antibiotic because not all the antibiotics are the same and they're constantly changing as to which antibiotics they're seeing is working best for bacterial infections. And then antivirals. UC Davis Veterinary Medical Teaching Hospital has been doing some studies on using famiclovir in treating neonatal kittens with feline herpes virus. And feline herpes virus is one of the most common causes of URIs in kittens and cats. So they don't really have any of their studies published yet, but I'm just throwing it out there. The other thing too is I'm not a veterinarian. Some of this information might be available in journals that are not released on the internet yet. These are things you can discuss with your veterinarian. I'm going to finalize this by giving you a gentle reminder. You are fighting against the odds here. In the first two weeks, kittens are 13 times more likely to die. Kittens with a URI are four times more likely to die. Feline herpes virus is one of the most common causes of feline URIs. And as one source states, in neonatal kittens, the infection can generalize and is associated with neurological signs and a high mortality rate. The veterinary literature reports intimidating mortality rates for orphan kittens up to 12 weeks of age, ranging from 15% to 40%. That means one to four kittens out of 10 die before the age of 12 weeks of age. And the biggest determinants of natural kitten loss are low birth weight and poor growth rates. Up to 60% of kittens born with a low birth weight will fail to thrive under natural conditions. When you combine that with a URI, that number gets higher. I'm not saying this so that you get depressed, you give up, or you don't try. It's always good to try, but it's best to keep your expectations realistic, to know that if they do pass away, it doesn't mean you failed. I say this because you need to have your expectations realistic and know that you can do everything right. You can do everything on this list and the kitten still may pass away and that's hard to deal with. But there's always a chance. So you try, fail, try again the next time. And on that note, I'm going to end the video here. If you have a tip that I have not included, put it in the comments. Otherwise, please like, subscribe, share, comment. That all helps YouTube get my videos shown to more people. I make these videos because I'm hoping to help other people save more kittens. And here are all of my references. As you can see, I have quite a few. Um, so you may need to slow this down and as well as the videos. I have all of these included in the description of my video as well as some locations where you can buy some of these objects that I have talked about.